Good morning, everyone. It's a real honor and privilege for me to be back here at the Lubbock Church. I was in Muleshoe last week and the week before that in Level Land, and it's nice to be back here. I see a lot of familiar faces, and it always makes me feel good to be back at home. Many of you know I've been on the road a lot, and I was uh, enjoyed Brother Elton's comment after that last song, I Am a Poor Wayfaring Stranger, the last song before we got into prayer service. Uh, you know, traveling through this world of woe, I know he's on the road a lot and traveled a lot and has in his lifetime, and you all know I do too, and I've been known to sing that song on the road a lot because it, it helps me even identify physically with the spiritual thought that's displayed in that song. Glad to have our visitors here today from Level Land. Our some Amarillo over here. Uh, I always think of these three girls over here as three peas in a pod. <laughs> Shanna, Sierra, and Kelsey. Uh, they, uh, I usually see them together when they're here, but we're, we're glad you're all here this morning. Thank you all for coming down. Glad to have all our other visitors here this morning. What subject's on my mind this morning is I want to talk to you particularly about the events surrounding one of the apostles. I know that we... Most of the time when we talk of an apostle, we talk about the apostle Paul. He's the one that is so prominently featured uh, in the New Testament because of all the writings he did. You'll recall, though, he is not really mentioned in the four Gospels. He doesn't come along until the book of Acts, Apostle Paul, but then he's mentioned quite heavily. The other apostle we think about many times is the apostle John, simply because he did so much writing, too. He wrote the Gospel of John, then he wrote John 1, 2, 3, and he also wrote the book of Revelation. And Paul, of course, wrote all of his books there in the middle of the Bible. Think of them. Who I want to talk to you about is the Apostle Peter. Apostle Peter is one that you, we all know and we've all heard of, but we don't talk about him specifically too much, not near like we do, especially the Apostle Paul. <coughs> Apostle uh, John, for instance, was mentioned, I believe, if I count correctly, it was 29 times in the New Testament. Apostle Peter and, and Apostle Paul was behind him, actually. Lesser mentioned in him is in the 20s with those two. Apostle Peter is referenced 195 times in the New Testament. Apostle Peter gives us some wonderful examples about our lives and about how our interplay should be with our between our spiritual lives and our worldly lives. He was a great leader in the church, but he was also a man, and he made a lot of mistakes. And the problem with that is that, and, and it's where I, you know, I can't identify with Apostle Peter. I'm not the type of leader he was, but when you look at the mistakes he makes, boy, do I identify with those. And his mistakes are spelled out for us. You know, the Apostle uh, Paul, once he uh, you know, was regenerated on the road to Damascus, and we read all about him. You know, he was a great prosecutor of the church, and he sent men, women, and children, created all sorts of havoc in the church, sent them all to prison when he would catch them worshiping. But then once he was regenerated on the road, after that, boy, he was solid as a rock, you know, and his, his teachings were wonderful. And we, he, our, the New Testament wouldn't be the same without all his explanations of how our great doctrine works. The Apostle Peter, though, was one of the earlier ones called. He was the first apostle named by Christ. One of the earlier ones clearly what we would call called, regenerated, born again. And yet even after that, he continued to make some mistakes. And I think it's from a lot of those things that he did that there's great teachings and great learnings for us through the Bible. And again, his mistakes are recorded. Thank goodness mine are not because the book is not big enough to handle mine. But he, I, I would like to go through and talk a little bit about the Apostle Peter and some of the things that he did. And we'll get, we'll, there's too many to, to reference. Like I said, he's referenced 195 times, if my count was correct, in the New Testament. And we'll cover a few of those this morning. But just generally, 
Uh, let's talk about Apostle Peter was clearly one of those that was what, in, in what was called the inner circle of Christ. He was one of three apostles who did certain things with Christ that a lot of the other apostles were not involved in. Apostle Peter, Apostle John, and Apostle James. Uh, John and James, of course, were brothers. Uh, Peter was the third one there. Peter's brother Andrew was the one that first introduced him, to, introduced Peter to uh, John the Baptist when he was preaching and then also to Christ. But Peter was in that three-part inner circle, John, James, and Peter, uh, that did certain things with Christ, at least that we know of, maybe other things, that only those three were included in. Over there in, I believe it's the fifth chapter of Mark, we're talking about, and it's also in other, other Gospels, where we're told about how uh, Jesus went and to uh, look upon Jairus' daughter, uh, Jairus' daughter, who was on the verge of death. And, of course, we know he delayed getting there. This is when the lady touched the back of his garment, and he, he felt it immediately and stayed and addressed her for a minute. Then he went on to Jairus' house where the daughter was dying, and it says before he went to the house, though, he had all the other disciples remain there except for Peter, John, and James. They got to go in and witness him. While When he got to Jairus' house, they said, well, you know, basically, you're too late. She's already died, you know. Y'all know that didn't bother Christ a bit. He said, no, she's not dead. She's merely asleep. And he went in and grabbed her by the hand. She was laying on the bed. He ran everybody else out of the house except the three disciples, the mother and the dad, went in there and grabbed her by the hand, and he said one word, arise. Now, first of all, let's stop here for a second. Do you think she said, I don't know if I want to get up or not? You know, I'm a teenager, I'm 12 years old, I'm just not even a teenager yet, and I'm not sure I want to get out of bed. What choice did she have on arising? This is another great example, like Lazarus, of how our call works with Jesus. We don't have a choice. When Jesus says, come, we come. That's the irresistible call. And that's why that story is there. That's why that story is there, and that's why the story of Lazarus is there. When he said, arise, she came off that bed, and she was alive. And that's how Jesus finds all of us in a spiritual sense. He finds us dead. We are dead spiritually. <clears throat> and, you know, of course, you know, based on our the foreknowledge, he came to save his people. He came to save those that the Lord gave him. And that's who he comes and saves. And when he comes and calls you, you don't have, there's no question about it. There's no negotiation. There's no, let me think about, okay, I'll accept you and I'll come. There's none of that. You come. He comes and puts himself in your heart, and you come immediately. Peter got to witness this. He got to also witness the later event with, Larry, with uh, Lazarus. But he was one of the three that was included in this. Over, in, I believe it's the 17th chapter of Matthew, Peter was also among that inner circle that was included that Christ invited with him to go to the mountaintop. And that's where we have the, the transfiguration that took place. There appeared in, with Christ Moses and Elijah. And Christ himself was transformed in that moment in, in, in glow and was in all white. And they got to see the glory of Christ at that moment. And he, he made them, don't tell anybody about this until after I've been resurrected. But Apostle Peter, you know, Peter, this was his nature. He, you know, he jumped and says, hey, let's build an altar right here. Let's build three tabernacles, one to Moses, one to Elijah, one to you. And Christ said, stop, don't do that. You all have been able to witness this, and, but I don't want you talking about it until after I've been dead and resurrected. Finally, when if you all remember the night that Jesus was arrested, he had the Last Supper. Then he went across the valley up to the Mount, of Mount Olive and got up on the top of Mount Olive there, and he told all his disciples, y'all stay here and wait. But he said, Peter, John, and James, y'all come with me. And so Pope Apostle Peter was included in that inner circle. And he went over into the front edge of the Garden of Gethsemane, I hope to talk about this a little bit more in a minute. But remember, Jesus said, then y'all stay here and watch. He was going to be arrested later on, and he knew that. But he had Peter and John and James stay at the edge of the garden while he went inside and prayed the night before his arrest. So you see, Peter was an extremely important leader, not only in the church, in the New Testament, but he was very close to Christ, one of the three most close. We have a number of instances that y'all are very familiar with, the Apostle Peter. Apostle Peter was the very first apostle called by Christ. All the lists you see with the apostles, it starts off, and first there was Peter. He called Apostle Peter first. Peter became more or less the uh, impromptu leader of the group of apostles. 
Remember there in the 16th chapter of Matthew when Jesus went to ask, who is it that people say I am? Some people think, you know, that he was John the Baptist or Elijah or Jeremiah or one of those other old prophets. And it was Apostle Peter that says, thou art Christ, the son of the living God. And Christ said, you know, no man told you that, but the Lord revealed it to him. The Lord chose Peter to reveal to first and make it clear to him this was the son of the living God. He hadn't learned that from anybody, but got it revealed straight from heaven. If you remember on the day of Pentecost, who was the preacher that preached the sermon that day that 3,000 people joined the church? It was the Apostle Peter. We talked about this a little over a week ago in our Wednesday night studies. We talked about how Peter preached this great sermon preaching from the Apostle Joel. Uh, and we, we noted there that the, the words are mistaken many times for implying this is what you've got to do to have eternal life when it's actually timely salvation that's being talked about by the prophet Joel there that Apostle Peter quotes from when he encourages people to you know, repent and be baptized. What do we need to do? You need to repent and be baptized <clears throat> because the salvation that you'll get from that is daily salvation time salvation you get a great you know refreshing of spirit and, and newness of mind and, and your conscience is clear when you're saved when you join the church when you do those things you're supposed to do you do those good deeds apostle peter right on later you read on in his especially in his two books first peter and second peter he had a great understanding of our salvation he had a great understanding that of christ and the lord and the holy spirit and how those three work together he had a great understanding that we are given our eternal salvation, that Lord puts his faith into each one of us. But then we have to add to our faith. He was the one that properly fitted together the, our doctrines of predestination and salvation by works. We are saved eternally by predestination, but then we save ourselves by our works, conditioned upon our works. The Lord blesses us today and tomorrow. When we do the things we're supposed to do, Apostle Peter points that out very clearly. Now that you've been given faith, add to that faith. And then when you do so, then you're not blind and you can see close and, and you're truly blessed by the Spirit. He was, Apostle Peter was the one first chosen to speak to the Gentiles. You remember the Jews didn't have anything to do with the Gentiles. Apostle Peter was chosen first by the Lord to start preaching to the Gentiles. Over there in the 10th chapter of Acts, the Apostle Peter had this great dream in which this great sheet was dropped down and all the unclean things. Back over in the Old Testament, you know, you can go read, there were things that were clean, there were things that were unclean. Certain animals you couldn't eat. That's, that's the reason they don't eat pork and pigs and ham and those type of things, bacon. A lot of the Jews didn't eat those back in those days because those were unclean. A lot of the animals that crawled, anything that dead, you can go read that back in Leviticus. There's a long list of things that were unclean you weren't to touch. Included among that was non-Jewish people. Non-Jewish people were not clean people back under the Old Testament. Peter was told in Acts 10 now, when he saw this great vision of this sheet being lowered down, full of unclean animals, and the Lord says, take it and kill it and eat it. And he goes, Apostle Peter goes, no, 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 I'm a good Jew. I don't do that. I don't eat those unclean things. He said, what I've cleaned, you don't dare to call unclean. And he encouraged him to eat it, and therefore encouraged him to go preach to the Gentiles. That was the first time it was made clear to Peter that us Gentiles get to share on this wonderful gospel and that we're included in his salvation. <coughs> Apostle Peter, if you'll remember the council that was held in, in, in uh, Jerusalem, I believe it's in the 15th chapter of, of the book of Acts where Apostle Paul was running across Peter that says, to be saved, not only do you have to, it's not just Lord, you still got to be circumcised, you still got to follow the law of Moses. And Peter stood up and preached to him and said, no, don't put that yoke on us like it was on our forefathers. Uh, we are saved purely and solely by the grace of God. We're not saved according to our own works. Apostle Paul in, in the 12th chapter of Acts, you remember, was put in prison. Put in prison and locked in prison. And they didn't trust him. The Jews didn't, got unhappy with him because he was still going out and preaching this character called Christ. He wasn't following the old Jewish law and he was preaching. And finally... They locked he and they locked James up. They ended up, Herod ended up executing James, killing him by the sword. Then he locked Peter up. And he says, I don't trust this guy about getting away. And he locked him up behind three guards. And then he put him in the prison and put a guard on each side of him. And then he bound him with either two or three chains, two chains, I believe, bound him up. Bound him up, had a guard on each side of him, and then had three guards, watch guards, and then a big iron gate to get out. And in the middle of the night, spirit shone down, a light shone down on that prison 
told Peter to stand up. He stood up. His chains fell to the ground. He went through. Both guards, nobody bothered him. He said he couldn't believe it. If he had even thought it in vision, Apostle Peter said. But he went through both those guards and got to the front gate, and it swung open. He had an angel accompanying him, swung open by itself. Surprised everybody back who was praying for him. There's a great lesson in that about while Peter was in prison, the church was in town praying for him. It tells you the power of prayer. It's a great lesson in and of itself. I'm skipping through a lot of these because they're all what happened to Apostle Peter. I want to impress on you how much Peter was involved in in all the great lessons that are contained in that. If you remember that, Peter was the one that confronted Ananias. Ananias, which had sold a piece of his wife, Sapphire, I believe is her name. They sold a piece of land. They were going to give it to the church. Instead, they only gave a small portion of it. And Peter was the one that confronted them about that, uh, made a confrontation with them. Apostle Paul described Peter as a pillar of the church. He was a great pillar of the church. But in spite of that, Peter had a lot of weaknesses. And that's what I want to present to you today. Peter gives us such a beautiful lesson. It does to me, when I see some of the mistakes Peter made, I'm going, boy, that's me. Exactly. And I'm not the leader he was, but I appreciate the fact that his mistakes are spelled out for us here. Because I see myself in so many of the things that he did. We know that the Apostle Peter uh, was actually ended up being imprisoned in Rome, and he died. He was born about 1 B.C., within probably a year of the time Christ was born. So he was about the same age as Christ. Of course, he lived beyond that. He lived to about 67, 68 A.D. He was imprisoned in Rome in what's called the Mamertine Prison, same prison as the Apostle Paul. Probably about a year or two after Paul, Nero imprisoned him and locked him up because he was stirring up these Christians too much. So he locked him up in this same underground dungeon. You know, Rome, when it was built, it was a very modern society at that time. They built an underground sewer system. <clears throat> they didn't build prisons, didn't think they needed them, but they converted this underground sewer system into a prison there. And it had, you know, full of, you can imagine a sewer system full of rats and mice and all sorts of bugs. And they locked up the Apostle Paul there for several years. And when they took him out and, and killed him, beheaded him, then they locked up the Apostle Peter there. That's not in the Bible, but you'll see that the Romans kept wonderful records. They were not only, they ran a good government, civil government, but they had a good record keeping. That prison is still there. You can go read about it on the inter internet. The Mamertine Prison. Apostle Peter was locked up there for the last years of his life before Nero then had him crucified on the cross. Peter had one request. If you're going to crucify me, crucify me upside down. I'm not worthy to be crucified in the same manner that Christ was. So they crucified him upside down on the cross. That comes from our secular history. But again, the Romans kept wonderful records. One of the greatest lessons we have, and y'all all know it, but it, it, let's get more specific with some of these examples. One of the greatest lessons we have that's taught throughout the New Testament is on the act of forgiveness. We are to forgive those who have trespassed against us in any way. Peter struggled with this. You know, I struggle with this. I mean, many of you, it's, I'm hard, somebody did, I'm, it's, it's hard for us to forgive somebody who's trespassed on us. But Peter thought he was getting it down. And there's a great lesson in this over in the 18th chapter of Matthew. But the Apostle Peter goes to Christ and he says, you know, you, you preach all this about forgiveness. And I understand that. says, but... When the guy keeps doing it to me over and over again, how many times do I have to forgive him? Are you suggesting as many as seven times? Seven was a number that was often used in Jewish law that you did things. And so seven times, what was it? Christ's answer when someone you're here, you have the duty to forgive, not seven, but seven times, 70, 490, and basically means unlimited. There's no limit on how many times we have to forgive. And again, that's a sermon in itself. But I just want to point out to you, how many of that was Apostle Peter that asked that. They went out on a limb and asked the dumb questions that Christ then used as a wonderful example. Because of Peter's boldness to speak and for the things that he did and the actions he took, and sometimes wrong, and sometimes he made himself look foolish, but he's given us wonderful examples in the Bible. I want to go over about three or four of them now that are back to back. I'm going to start in John chapter 13, that I want to focus in a little bit more with what Peter taught us by his actions. John chapter 13, and again, this is one many of you will be familiar with. John chapter 13, they had just finished the Last Supper, and Jesus took off his coat and laid it aside and said, he poured water into a basin and began to wash 
his disciples' feet. If there's anybody that's familiar with this story, it ought to be us. It ought to be the Primitive Baptists. We're one of the few, I said, you know, probably in this town, there's maybe at best uh, a, a handful, you can count them on one hand, the people that still believe in feet washing. And I've said you could use my hand. There's just not many in town that believe this. And yet the example is a wonderful example about service to our fellow man. It involves not only service, but also this great doctrine of forgiveness. You know that Jesus poured water into a basin, began to wash his disciples' feet, and dried them off. Verse 6 of chapter 13. Then he cometh to Simon Peter. And, Simon, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And I've worded that in my own language, but... You think you're going to wash my feet, Lord? No way. You're not washing my feet. Peter was one that several times we find tried to rebuke the Lord. You ever done that? Lord, I know that's what you said, but that ain't worked for me. Uh, I can't do that, Lord. I, I know you told us and you told us the blessings, but no. You know, whether it's because you don't feel worthy of it or you think you need to go a direction. Lord, I'm not doing that. And he said, you think you're going to wash my feet? And Jesus answered him and said, what I do, what I do, thou knowest not now. Now, remember, a lot of people say this is just nothing but a tradition. Nobody knew traditions better than Peter. Remember over there when we talked about the dream and they tried to get him to eat the unclean food? And Peter said, no, no, I'm a good Jew. I understand. Jews don't eat this. I understand Jewish law. He understands Jewish law. And Jesus said, Lord, do you know what I'm about to do to you, Peter? He said, you don't know. But thou shalt know hereafter. Peter said to him, Lord, shalt never, thou shalt never wash my feet. <laughs> you ever said never? Remember, there's a good example right here that Apostle Peter, don't ever, never say never. Thou shalt never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Now, Jesus is not talking about eternal salvation there. The fact that Jesus, Peter is there and one of his apostles and he's interacting with Jesus, he's already a child of God. That's clear. God is telling him, this is part of that timely salvation I'm talking to you about. There's a great blessing in washing feet. And when you do this, you have a part of me. You get to enjoy the spiritual blessings of the kingdom of God that you have right here on earth. It's a great timely blessing, he says. What I do, thou knowest not, but thou shalt know hereafter. If I wash thee not, thou hast no part of me. Well, Peter's not dumb either. He asks dumb questions sometimes, but he's not dumb because he said, Lord, then not my feet only, but my head and my hands. Give me a bath, Lord, if that's what it takes to be part of you. I've been in this both the times, you know, when we want to tell the Lord, negotiate with the Lord on what we do, but then when it becomes clear, Lord, you've made it clear, I'll do whatever I need. It goes on here and he says, after he'd washed their feet, he told them, you don't know what I've done to you. All these Jewish men, these 12 Jewish men, many of them who were very well versed in the law, they didn't have a clue why he had done this. Not a tradition because they didn't understand it. He said, you call me Master and Lord and you say, well, for I am. If I then, if your Lord and Master have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I've given you this an example that you should do as I have done to you. There's a lot of people that say that that's foolish. You shouldn't. That's, that's a foolish deal. Washing feet is something foolish and silly, and you shouldn't do that. If I say that, if I tell you that, then I'm saying the words, even though Jesus said you ought to one, wash one another, I'm saying, well, no, you ought not to. And how foolish does that sound after he said you ought to? It's an example. It had nothing to do with our eternal salvation. But he said there's, what he's telling us is there's a great blessing in this. And, and, and I wish more people could see us when we have our feet washing service because I think it's one of the most solemn services we have. You see tears pour out of men's eyes that you wouldn't see because when they bow down at somebody else's feet, it's hard not to forgive somebody who bends over and washes your feet. Dad used to have a saying, he said, it's kind of hard to stab somebody in the back when you're bending over and, and you put your back to him. And that's what it's about. That's what Jesus has taught us. And Peter learned that lesson like no other man did. In that same chapter, of 13th chapter of John, get over here, Jesus gives them this new commandment that Peter was able to witness. The Lord gets here and he says, verse 34 of that same chapter 13. And this goes right along with what he's trying to teach them. I give unto you... That ye love one another, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to the other. Do I need to go join a church to prove I'm a child of God? 
No, do I need to join the church? Do I need to be baptized? Do I need to give to the church? Do I need to go visit people in prison? Do I need to do something specific to prove I'm a child of God? Do I need to say I'm born again? Do I need to say, Lord, <clears throat> I accept you into my life. Please come into my life. Jesus here says, no. That ye love one another as I have loved you. Love one another by this, by this act, by your love of a fellow man, shall all men know that you are my disciples, if ye have love one to the other. You can fly, get on a plane. I've heard this example. You can get on a plane, fly, fly to the darkest jungles of Africa and get off the plane, and there are men there that would just immediately cut your throat. There are also men there who would come to your aid, who don't know you, don't have a care about you, but immediately come to your aid. Never heard the gospel preached to them, don't know, know what a Bible is, wouldn't it? But yet, that's the story of the Good Samaritan. I don't owe you anything. I don't have to help you at all. don't owe you any legal duty. And yet, I come to your aid. I show love one man to the other. Anybody that you see doing that, Jesus says, that's a sign that you're my disciple. That's a sign to all other people that you're a child of God, is that you show your love one to the other. Then we have this wonderful example that Peter is so well known for. And boy, do I identify with this one. Begins in verse 36, and it's in all four Gospels. Here it says, And Simon Peter said to him, Where are you about to go to, Lord? Where are you going? Again, Peter was known for questioning Christ from time to time. Brave man. Where are you going? Jesus answered him, Whither I go, thou canst not follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. I'm about to leave you. This is on the last night. Lord's Supper, I'm about to leave you. Where I go now, you can't follow, but you'll get to come later. And Peter said unto him, Lord... Why can't I not follow you now? Why not, Lord? I want to go. I mean, you know, this guy's doing what, I, what lawyers call cross-examination of Christ. Why not? Why can't I go, Lord? <clears throat> Why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. You know, I've been known to do this. Come to church and I get all revved up and feeling good and I'll do anything for the Lord. I'll do anything it needs to be due. I'll lay down my life for him. And then Christ says, before the morning... Before the rooster crows in the morning, you will have denied me three times. Boy, do I fall in that boat. You know, when he talks about denying, you see, it's, 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 we, you know, sometimes we uh, waver in our love of Christ when we get outside the church house. We do real good when we're here, me included. I'm talking to myself. When we get out of here, sometimes we don't show that we are children of God like we ought to. And again, I'm not talking about our eternal salvation. Peter was a child of God, but yet... The Lord says, I know you. I know you and I know the flesh and it'll, you'll be tempted and you'll deny me three times before in the morning. Wilt thou, wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto you, till the, crock shall, till the cock shall crow, you, the, you will have denied me thrice, three times. Gives us a great example. We go on and I'm going to skip through some of this. That this is taking place. Jesus does some teaching there in John. We get over to the 16th and 17th chapter of John, 17th chapter of John, I talked to you a minute ago about how the Lord led all his disciples out of that last supper and that last conversation he had after his teaching. He led them on the up to the Mount of Olives. And there then he said, stop now everybody. But he asked Peter and John and James to go with him into the Garden of Gethsemane. And then he got to the gate of the garden and he said, now you three wait here and watch for me. Be a guard for me. And, you know, he knew they were going to come and arrest him. Excuse me. And he said, I want you to stay here and watch for me, and I'm going to go in and pray. Luke gives us a great uh, picture of this over in, in Luke, but here it's, it's uh, summarized here, but we know that Jesus went in and prayed and prayed for about an hour. We know he prayed so hard, he knew what was about to happen to him. He knew he was going to suffer merciless on the cross, suffer great passion at the hands of these Roman soldiers and just be beat. And, and, and I, he, he prayed, and we see that Luke tells us he, he sweated as if it were great drops of blood. He went in and prayed for probably close to an hour, best we can tell. And he came back out to the garden gate where these three disciples were. And how did he find them? He found them asleep. I'm, going, I'm guilty. <laughs> you know, we shouldn't go to sleep in church, but we do at times, don't we? And I'm guilty too. I'm, I'm as guilty as anybody of being that. Every now and then I'll nod off, you know. Spirit is strong, as Jesus tells them, but I know the flesh is weak. He says, can't you stay with me for one hour? 
We start at 11, we end at 12. Can't you stay with me for one hour? If you go to sleep, and you may feel guilty about whatever, but you're no different than the Apostle Peter, John, and James. And I'm in that same boat. I've been known to let myself get tired in the flesh. And even though I'm willing and want to hear something, I may do like they did and fall asleep. And he went back inside and prayed again. He told him, can't you spend one hour with me? And again, there's such a wonderful sermon right there. If we could spend one hour a day with Christ. He went in and prayed to the Lord for a full hour. And if you want to, we talk about over in, in the Sermon on the Mount being the Lord's Prayer. That's not the Lord's Prayer. That's our prayer. The Lord's Prayer is here in the 17th chapter of John. That's where the Lord's Prayer is. That's where he went in and prayed to the Lord. It's a wonderful prayer, and I encourage you to read it. But he comes back and tells his disciples, can't you spend one hour with me? And I would challenge you, like he challenged Peter, spend one hour a day with the Lord. Get up in the morning and read your Bible. Get up in the morning and read something good. Get up in the morning and praise. Take a time during your day to be with the Lord. You're not going to pray with the intensity that Christ did, where he sweated. I mean, I, I'm going, how did Peter and the apostles not see that when Jesus came back out, his garments were wet with sweat from where he'd been praying? Spend one hour with the Lord. That's what the Lord asks you here. Ask of them, can y'all not be with me one hour? Give me one hour a day. It'll change your life. It'll change your priorities. It'll change everything you do in your life. If you'll take that time, as he told the Apostle Peter, take an hour with me. Give me an hour of your time, an hour a day. You'll find out, you think, well, I, well you know, I don't have time for that hour. I've got too much going on. And you'll find out you do. You have too much going on, and it's going to take you all day to get through it. If you'll spend that one hour with the Lord, you're going to be amazed at how well your day is going to go. You're going to be well amazed at how you get to 3 or 4 o'clock and you go, i got everything done. How'd that happen? I knew I had a long day. I've given this example before. You know, I get up in the morning and I don't have time to spend with the Lord. I've got to go into my office and I'm going to have to call on the phone. I'm going to have to argue with these lawyers and try to work out contracts and these type of things. I don't have time to spend reading the Bible. Then if I take, and you know, and I'm right. I get there and I'm going to argue with lawyers all day long and it's going to be a pain and that kind of thing. But in the morning, if I will remind myself, stop and read. Read the Bible. Pray a little bit. I get to the office, and it's amazing how easy those lawyers are to agree with. I don't know what happened. But then I find myself at the end of the day, and I've got everything in that I needed. Jesus told us this at the Sermon on the Mount. You know, seek ye first the kingdom of God. And everything you need will be given to you thereafter. We put him first. And that's what Lord gives us this great example. In the, in the Garden of Gethsemane there with these three. And in that, there's wonderful stuff in that prayer. I want to specifically point out to you uh, verse 9 of John 17. Everybody, when they want to recite to you, and if you watched any football games at any time, there's some guy in the end zone that's holding up the big sign when the kick next to the point says, John 3.16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. <clears throat> For God so loved the world. And he said, everybody then needs to go accept Christ and join the church. The same guy that wrote John 3.16 also wrote John 17 and 9. I pray for them, I pray not for the world. Now there's a direct conflict in there. Because it says, I pray for the, you know, God so loved the world. And here it is in verse 17 and 9, it says, I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. There's two different worlds there. And I'll leave that to Shannon dad and brother, sister Val's husband Gail preaches a great sermon on that about there's two different worlds we're talking about there and you've got to put them in the proper, proper context in fact there's several worlds I mean, over in John 3 16 God so loved the world that's the world of his elect that's who he's talking about here he is talking about the world in its entirety of the sense and she had to put those two together and not take them out of context we get over here another example of the apostle Peter and what he did that I identify with chapter 18 of Luke excuse me, of John, I'm in mean John. Here in chapter 18 where Jesus is arrested in the garden. He's arrested. They come and ask who he is. And he said, Jesus said, who are you seeking? All this band of soldiers and, and the uh, uh, aides to the priests all come to make arrest. A big band comes to arrest, just him. He said, whom do you seek? And they say, Jesus is Nazareth. And he says, well, I am he. And verse 6, and as soon as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backwards and fell to the ground. 
all he did was speak, I am he, and it, and it blew them down, knocked them all down with just the powerful power of his voice. That's how powerful of a man he was. But look, what apostle, what Peter does. And he asked again, whom seek you? And he said, I'm told you that's me. Verse 10, when they got ready to arrest him, then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the priest's servants, cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. The Lord says, Peter, put your sword up. It's not specifically referenced here, but over and we see in one of the other gospels. He put his sword up and Jesus took the man who's had his ear cut off and touched it and completely healed his ear. But Jesus also tells us in one of the other Gospels, it says, I don't need your help, Peter. You know, he said, at my command, I can have uh, 12 legions of angels. Thank you, 12 legions of angels. Now, a legion is 6,000, 6,000 soldiers. So that's, I can have 72,000 angels. And this is just, you know, hyperbole, because it, it doesn't matter. One angel we know was about to destroy the entire city of Jerusalem as David watched when the Lord stopped him. So one angel can destroy an entire metropolitan city. I have 72,000 angels here at my beck and call. Peter, I don't need your help. Put it up. You know what? The Lord needs my help. He needs my help. I need to tell him, Lord, here's what I need you to do. You ever been in that boat? Lord, <clears throat> this man sinned against me, and I need to tell you what you need to do to him. I need to help. The, the Lord needs my help. You know, you ever known anybody you think, you know, they think, well, the Lord is blessed to have me on his side. <laughs> it, it, it's a good thing the Lord has me working for him. The Lord doesn't need our help. And it's foolish when we think he does. He lets us know right here, I don't need your help. I can do all things. We just need to figure out what the Lord wants done and do it. As Brother Joe prepared a while ago about being submissive to the Lord. We need to be submissive. And he told Peter, put up. Well, Peter, and, and, and look, look why Peter did it. Because Peter's fixing to do something else here that's exactly opposite. He's going to defend the Lord. Remember he said, I'll lay down my life for you. And boy, he's intending to do it here. His juices are built up and his adrenaline's flowing. And he pulls out a sword and cuts off one of them. And that's good. That's going to Peter at his good sign. But then so they arrested him. The minute they arrested Christ, what did the disciples do? They all turned and ran. Said they all fled away from him. They didn't want to be arrested. Isn't that just like us? It's just like me. I'm hot one minute. I may get out this afternoon. And I may have something, and you may not know that I'm a child of God by the way I act. From one minute to the next, they all fled. They all took and ran. We after this, then we see that he's arrested. Peter follows them. Not only in the Book of John, but it's also spelled out in the other Gospels. When they arrested Christ and took him in to see the high priest, he had six trials. They took him before those six trials. And when they did, Pastor Peter followed them. If you go over and look at, I believe it's Matthew, it says he followed them from afar. Lord, I'm with you. I'm back here in the back. I can see you up there, and I'm staying far enough back that I'm not going to get involved in the trouble. I'll follow you from afar. Lord, I'm on your side, but even though I don't always say it, and even though always I stand back, I don't come to the aid of people that you've told me to, and I don't do what you want. Lord, I'm back here. I'm back in the back of the room. Lord, I'm here. He followed him from afar and said he watched. And he went to the first place. He stood outside the palace. And a lady goes and says, aren't you with Christ? Aren't you one of his followers? No way. Not at all. No, I am not. You know, Aren't you one of those goody two-shoes that goes to church on Sunday? No, I don't get into that. Denied him. No, I don't have anything to do with that guy. He went in and did it again. And one time he went in and where the Roman soldiers had started a fire, a fire of coals. I believe that's mentioned to us in Matthew and John 18 and 18. They'd started a fire of coals. Peter went up and joined in with the other people against Christ, the Roman soldiers, and warmed himself to the fire. It's a coal of fire. I think that comes back to haunt Peter later. But three times he was asked by different people, are you with him? Are you with him? And Peter goes, no, and it says in one time it said he actually said, no, I am not, and said he cursed and swore and said, I'm not with that guy. I don't know him. Don't have anything to do with him. Three times he denied Christ. I mean, it, of course, on the last one when he did it, the crow, rooster crowed, and Peter then wept bitterly. I've been in that same boat. If you've ever been in that boat where you get confronted about, you know, well, you get in the wrong crowd, and especially when I was a kid, this probably used to happen to me more. You know, you'd have, you'd get in trouble. If you went to church or if you said, I'm not going to go do that so I can go to church, 
I'm not going to go to the football games because you're going to church. You're going to go to church rather than to a Texas Tech football game. You know, you're criticized if you're a follower sometimes. Peter bore himself naked for us right here in this gospel about how he did this. And we're no different. He gives us this wonderful example, but we're about to see how Christ responded. Did Christ come back out later and chew on Peter? thought you said you weren't going to deny me and made fun of him. Did Christ mention it again later that you said you weren't going to deny me and now you have? Christ never mentioned it. But Peter, I can guarantee you, remembered it. He remembered that he denied him three times. If you jump over here, I'll skip over here in the interest of time. Let's go to the 21st chapter. 21st chapter of John is almost like an added on John. Any of you were at Snyder a couple of weeks, two or three weeks ago, uh, Mark, my nephew Mark, spoke on this, and I understand he did a wonderful job about how this was kind of an added on chapter, chapter 21. After Christ's death and burial and resurrection, he shows up here with these apostles. And what does the apostle, after he's died and gone away, they think he's gone forever, what did they decide to do? They decided to go fishing. What else would you do? You know, we get out of church sometime, and I've got that. I've got that great big nice meeting out of the way, and we've had a good time. But now I'm not going to do anything, apply anything that I learned. I'm just going to go back to what I was doing before. He was a fisherman before. I mean, you know, keep in mind, these fishermen were tough and mean and vile and vulgar. When it says over there, he swore, I'm sure he used the worst language possible when he did that because that would prove, yep, yep, keep you away from me. I don't want to be suffered like this man suffered. Fishermen, you know, if you ever talk about going down along the wharf where fishermen work and listen, you better close your ears because, you know, the language is going to be pretty rough. And they're all tough physically. That's the way Apostle Peter was. He was a Galatian, which means he spoke with a certain accent. And they recognized him. One of the ladies there recognized him because of his accent, but yet he cursed and denied. We get over here in chapter 21 when Christ showed up while these guys were out there fishing on the boat. And John first recognized that that's Jesus on the side. Jesus told them how to gather great fishes. Drop your net down on the right side of the boat. If you go back and look over in the first, which I believe it's Luke, where <clears throat> Jesus showed up for the very first time when Peter was fishing and said, Drop your net down at his instruction. When he did, they gathered up so many fish, it broke the net. Here, they gathered great fishes, and it didn't break the net. But they were all fishermen, and he gathered a great fish for them. They came to shore, verse 9 in verse of chapter 21. As soon then as they were come to land, when they came to land with Christ, they saw a fire of coals there. There's only two fires of coals in the entire New Testament. One is right here that Jesus, it's interesting, he had a coal fire going, and they tell us that. What kind of fire was that that Peter stood by when he was denying Christ? It was a fire of coals, same type of fire. I have a feeling that was all the reminder Peter probably needed. He said he swam to shore. He didn't ride to shore. He jumped in the water and swam to shore. And what did Christ say after Peter had denied him all this, denied him three times after he promised he wouldn't? Christ said, come sit down and eat with me come and dine invited him to come and dine then he asked Peter these wonderful questions again uh, there's sermons in all of these we ask him these wonderful questions Simon lovest thou more than these everybody wonders who what he's talking about there what he's talking about when he says these he's talking about these other apostles his friends I think he's talking about the fish it makes great emphasis that he caught great fish Peter was a fisherman and what's better for a fisherman than catching big fish? I mean, that's what we brag about when we're fishermen. I caught one this big, you know. Uh, Peter got all these great fish, and I think you know, Christ looks at him and says, you've gone back to fishing now. Peter, is that what you want to do that I'm gone? You want to go back to fishing? You want to go back to your old job? Or do you want to go to work for me? Do you love me, Peter? Yeah, feed my lambs. Do you love me, Peter? You know, Peter's getting frustrated here. You know I do, Lord. And feed my sheep. Peter, go to work for me. And I'll take care of you. And not only that, it's a good example there about feeding my lambs and feeding my sheep. He gave the same instruction to one man. Feed the kids and feed the adults. It's a good example here of one reason that we don't have what they call Sunday schools. And we believe everybody ought to come in the church. No matter what age they are, they ought to come in the assembly and hear the same message. Both the young and the old can be fed from the same trough. Here, Apostle of Jesus tells Apostle Peter, feed my sheep, feed my lambs. He gave the same instructions to both men. He didn't say, no, John, you go feed the children, and Peter, you go feed the adults. Same person. Preachers should be able to preach to everybody. And Lord, 
Lord will deliver the message. The Lord will deliver the message he needs them to hear. By the way, I, I won't, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll stop to tell you about 2 Peter. You need to go read 2 Peter, and 1 Peter and 2 Peter, because there Christ, uh, I mean, the Apostle Peter tells us about the doctrine. He tells us his great understanding of doctrine. Let's just know it's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. He lets us know that we are saved by the righteousness of Christ, not by our own righteousness in 2 Peter, the first few verses. But he tells us, you got your faith from Christ. Now add to your faith. And he gives us all these wonderful good works we're to do to add to our faith. And if we do those, then we're greatly blessed. If we don't do them, do we lose our grace? Do we lose our salvation? No. He says, but you are blind and can't see afar off, and you forget that you were purged of your old sin. Your sin is still purged, but you forget about it. We've all known people that at one time knew the truth, and they get away from the church, and they get caught up in all these other doctrines, and they forget that their sins have been purged. And they think, I've got to do something to get rid of my sins. I've still got to go do something. I've got to join the church. I've got to be baptized. I've got to give to the sick. I've got to give to the church. I've got to do all these things. Peter said, no, that's your job after you've been eternally saved. And in doing those things, you'll be richly blessed. Last thing I'll tell you about the Apostle Peter, which to me is his greatest blessing, and I did preach on this about a year ago. Go back over there, and I believe it's the 14th chapter of Matthew. All the disciples are on the boat, and they're in the middle of the night. It's like 3 a.m. great storm comes up, and they get scared. And these are fishermen. They shouldn't be scared, but they do get scared. Uh, they get scared, which tells you that even sometimes the leaders get scared. Even your ministers get scared from time to time. We're not always as strong and as stable as we ought to be. Great lesson in that for the ministers. But they're sitting there getting scared because they think they're all going to drown, and suddenly they look, and here comes Christ walking on the water. It scares them for they think it's a ghost at first, but then they recognize him, and Peter says, Lord, if it be your will, let me come to you. Christ says, come on. Peter stepped out of the boat and started walking on the water. You know, we have this deal about, well, there's only been one person ever walked on water. That's Christ. That's not true. Peter walked on water. He walked on water until... He looked up and got scared at the storm. Boy, that is me. Sometimes I'll think, you know, I, yeah, I'm doing good, and I'll work, and I'll go out, and I'll come, I'll do what Christ says, and I'll go, and then I get scared. And I look up, and I look away from Christ. I get scared, and I start, oh, my goodness, I'm going to die. What did Jesus do? Go read that. It says, immediately Christ reached out his hand and saved him. Christ is not going to let you fall, even when you make a mistake. But the most important lesson there is, and I preached on this, if you want to walk on water, you got to get out of the boat. Think about Matthew who wrote that wonderful example. Matthew was there, but he stayed in the boat, as did all the other 11. That had been me. I'm going, I'm not going to get out there on that water. I don't know if I can trust Christ. Peter did. He gave us a wonderful example. Everybody says, well, this makes him look foolish. That's his worst hour. I think it was his finest hour. Peter's the only one that followed Christ and do what he said. The rest of us, I'm, 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 I'm afraid I'm going to fail. If I step in that water, I'm going to drown. Did Christ let Peter drown? Peter stepped out of the boat and walked on water and did it successfully till he looked away. And of course, that'd be me too. But it said immediately, not wait a while, not wait till he got underwater, let him scared. Immediately, Christ reached out his hand and saved him. Like Peter, if you want to walk on water, you got to get out of the boat. You've been very kind with your attention. My prayer is that the Lord will richly bless you. This time, uh, Brother Randall, if you would, have a song. We sing a song to close our service. First verse of that song, if any of you have a desire at any time, but we usually open the first verse of that, to join the church, if you'll come forward and let your wishes be known. After the first verse, those who desire, it's not required, but those who desire, we usually exchange the right hand to fellowship by our traditions. Brother Randall, do you have a song? Number 114. Let me stand if you'd like. Go ahead, Brother Randall.
Okay, it's on now. Brother Cecil wants to say something to the church, so before we have our prayer, I'm going to ask Brother Larry Richards to, to word our closing prayer, but I'll let Brother Cecil speak first. It is so good to be back into the house of the Lord. Last time I was here was the first weekend in July, and I've, I've missed it. I've had a few problems since then, but the Lord's blessed me to halfway get over it anyway. I'm not well, but I'm getting there. I want to thank the church so much for all their love. for all of their transportation that we've had to have, for the food that's been brought in. You would think I'd weigh 200 pounds. But <laughs> but, no, I'm working on it. I've gained nine since I got out of the hospital. I, I just lost 20 while I was in there, so. but. It is so good, and I want to thank each one of you, especially after Pat had her stroke. I didn't know what in the world was happening at that time. But the Lord has come through. He says he'll never put any more on you than what you can bear. But there was a couple times I said, Lord, you're getting pretty close. If, you, if you'd take a step back, I would appreciate it. But we've made it. 